Yeah, I mean, there is something that comes through in in the book when you talk to certain people is you may have, yeah, they may have very different points of view from you and from myself, but they are sincere and they do seem to have a sincere principled view of things. They may not know what's going on in the, you know, in regards to certain subjects, so they may just not agree on that with you. But yeah, there is a real difference between an Ammon Bundy who's taking advantage of, I think, people's maybe fears or ignorance or whatever it is, and then someone who's just like sincere in their concerns because it is actually affecting them in their livelihood. When housing prices are going up, that affects everybody and how they're going to direct that frustration and anger is based on your beliefs and what you, you know, how you perceive the world around you and who's responsible. So it's, you know, just as an example, it's just a force that's bearing on people. So, um, uh, you know, I, I do want to talk about another character that, you know, speaking of the January 6th thing is directly connected to this. And this is really the point I wanted to get at, I think a major point, which is that when we look at the trajectory of, of, of what led up to what happened on that day on January 6th, a lot of it can be traced to stuff that was happening out West. I mean, you could trace it all the way back to Malheur and, and previous things too. A lot of that, a lot of those people that showed up, I think were kind of part of of some of those earlier um, uh, kind of events that, you, that you've written about. Um, and one of the people you talk about, you spend a good deal of time uh, writing about is uh, Stuart Rhodes, but through the eyes, particularly the eyes of his now ex-wife, um, uh, Tasha or Tasha uh, Adams. And, you know, she famously is like, thank God he, he's in jail or almost like relieved that he was convicted, um, that he is no longer able to lead this group, um, the Oath Keepers. Um, you know, if there's two major groups that I feel like were directly involved in trying to, you know, get, uh, you know, get into the Capitol building and, and sort of do even more um, heinous things. Um, it was the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about, yeah, I, I think that was what's so fascinating is you're sitting down, you're talking with her. She's telling basically her life story with this man, um, how they raise a family together, his, sort of in his own, like for, through her eyes and through her experience with him, his psychology um, and some of the decisions that he made over the course of his, his time as, as a leader of this organization. So could you talk about how you met Tasha, and just like that part of the book, I think it was really, really fascinating. Yeah, I, she is wonderful. I, in fact, I just heard from her this morning. We're going to try to do some events together because I just think she is the coolest, bravest. She's smart. She's funny. She now has these kids. I mean, all of his kids are estranged. And, mm. um, and so I went up and just went to breakfast with her. I, I went to Eureka, Montana, which is where she's living now. And, uh, we had a long chat. I mean, I, I, and we've kept in touch since then. I just think the world of her. And, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is that she and Stuart Rhodes started Oath Keepers. Oh, and right. so she's one of the few people, and I shouldn't say few, I, I talked to a number of people who've left that movement. I, I mean, I, I, I think they're, they're fewer, it, it's not, you know, hugely common, but I did talk to people who've left that, that, you know, sort of white Christian nationalist militia sort of community. Mm -hmm. But, um, but she, I think just has the most amazing um story and um, she she was a dance instructor and he sort of swept her off his or excuse me swept her off her feet mm. and they were you know young newlyweds and she saw him having so much potential and yet he never could quite keep a job um he asked her to go into he she stripped in las vegas in order to pay their bills um they were always kind of one step away of getting evicted and then he went to law school i mean he he went to yale law school and again she had this vision that he was going to be this incredibly successful guy and they together started Oath Keepers and actually started making money. And, and I think that's really important in looking at these things, 
how they can be monetized. I mean, we're, mm. we're in a situation right now where people make money from misinformation. People make money from um, anti-government agitating. People make money in talking about some of the things you were talking about before, like I'm a lonely, misguided person. I need to get involved in a community. Well, here's a community for you. And you only need to pay, you know, your pledge money. And so uh, Stuart was really actively recruiting people who were sort of lonely and disenfranchised and wanted something more. Mm -hmm. um, and so he really played into those feelings of, of and, and also, you know, wanting to feel more masculine, uh, wanting to feel more empowered. And so he he intentionally recruited people like that and um, and built the Oath Keepers, uh, which is now kind of falling apart, which is which is good news. I mean, he sure. but I, I just to kind of take it from from uh, what he was doing out west and he was in Nevada. He was also in Montana. Um, recruiting, but also recruiting all over the country. When I saw him in advance of the 2020 elections, he was at a an event called the Red Pill Expo, which was a gathering of conspiracy theorists from all over. So it was Stuart Rhodes already talking about the election being stolen, already talking about what he would do and the Oath Keepers would do to make sure Donald Trump stayed in office. And then he was speaking with Richard Mack, who is the head of the um, uh, Constitutional Sheriffs and Peacekeepers Association. He goes around the country telling sheriffs that they're the most powerful law enforcement in the land and they don't have to enforce, uh, you know, second, if anything comes out to to protect communities from guns um, or to, to in any re way regulate guns, sheriffs don't have to enforce that. I mean, they're, they're focused on um, Second Amendment and um, and so he and and he was also at the Battle of Bunkerville in Nevada with Stuart Rhodes uh, with the Bundy family, and they were sharing a stage with people who didn't believe COVID was real, uh, were complete anti-vaxxers, and um, and then you know at lunch they showed the movie uh, the Titanic never sank. So it was just, and then in the afternoon, they had um, a man who was talking about the lizard people who walk among us and are working to control the world. So, so I was seeing this coalition get put together that that was new. I mean, I, you had not seen people like Stuart Rhodes affiliating with the, the um, anti-vaxxers. And, and that includes you know, yoga moms. Uh, and yeah. so they were, they were really pulling together a coalition. And, you know, I think we now see it with Robert F. Kennedy, um, who also is appealing to these people who see themselves as liberals, but they do not want to have anything to do with vaccines. In fact, I don't know if you've heard this, but there's a growing percentage of people who believe that rabies shots give their dogs autism. And I am not making that up. I mean, this is this is something that people have gotten wild ideas um, that that happen in and around these these um, events and the the fact that they were building these coalitions. And yeah. now, you know, we still are seeing the the residual impacts. But in any case, um, that happened. And then, you know, we had the election and the um, January 6th insurrection, uh, um, you know, happened. I, I mean, I, and I, I'm sure like so many other people, I was watching it saying, we knew this was going to happen. We knew it. We could have, we we predicted it over and over. And I, I wrote two pieces for the New York Daily News because I couldn't get um, larger um, press outlets to, to take this seriously at the time. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, I wrote saying something, I think the headline was, you know, the, you know, never mind the Proud Boys, look at the Oath Keepers. And maybe mm -hmm. I shouldn't have said, never mind the Proud Boys because yeah. I, 
<laughs> the proud boys were every bit as important, but yeah. just as you're yeah. saying, it was the Oath Keepers and the and everybody was focused on the Proud Boys because of what um, Donald Trump did at the debate when he yeah. said, um, "Stand by and stand back, stand back and stand by." Mm -hmm. But um, but uh, you know, so I was I was watching this all happen because I was researching this book, and um, and they were already talking about it in advance of the election. So, um, so yeah, the, I trace the trajectory, um, uh, of the insurrection from the Bundy ranch, uh, all the way to, to, um, the, the, the Capitol building. Yeah. Well, it's, it was fascinating that, you know, I think this is a trend that, um, these people who are anti-government ostensibly, um, they don't want federal, control of lands they don't want any government you know intervention in their lives of course this got more again repeating myself amplified during the early years of the pandemic with public health measures culminating to but but the thing is is that when trump became the candidate um and for the republican party in 2015 and then into 2016 i guess um becoming president um they yeah they were very much behind him right is he kind of uh really did draw all these disparate groups together to kind of uh, under an umbrella, the kind of MAGA umbrella. Um, so I, I do think it's kind of fascinating how these, again, ostensibly anti-government groups ended up actually kind of supporting Trump and his his bid for, well, not just for re-election, but his, you know, his whole big lie notion that it was stolen from him. So I don't know. It's pretty fascinating. I wonder what the, uh, I think ultimately the underlying value has really nothing to do with, um, nothing to do with being libertarian or anti-government. It's more to do with their, it's frankly pretty authoritarian in their own, frankly. I mean, how else would you describe that? You know, it's, they don't like, they don't like the idea of a liberal democracy or any other kind of form of democracy. They prefer a sort of Christian nationalist theocratic regime that upholds their particular values that are imposed on everyone else. And I think that really came through, especially when Trump became their preferred guy, <laughs> because, you know, it doesn't seem like it was very consistent with their previous stated values. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and even it's interesting uh, when I talked to Ammon last and we talked about Donald Trump, he wasn't a particularly big fan of Donald Trump, but this anti-democracy i mean it is it is so uh, it, it i mean i i think just what you're saying like a strong man it's somebody who espouses the values um that they that they want to see imposed um mm -hmm. and i also think and i write a little bit about this too the during pandemic um there was a lot of uncertainty there was fear and I talked to a psychiatrist who talks about the fact that anger feels so much better than fear. And so that I think kind of came into play that this was this was a proactive thing that we could be mm -hmm. angry, we could fight back. Um, it was violent. And um, and I think that there were there were folks, you know, who I mean, guns were flying off the shelves during the years of pandemic. It it mm -hmm. was a time when people were enraged and we were also enraged at one another because we were getting narratives and stories about the right and left uh online and again a lot of it was monetized like there was there was like the monetized yeah. um anger like you could get you could get so into it and and um and go through you know down rabbit hole after rabbit hole um but it was just you know i mean i have to say that one of the reasons why i wrote this book is because I was tired of being so angry. And I, and I really was, I mean, the, the Trump years were scary and they were infuriating. And, um, and I did myself feel a great deal of anger and didn't understand why so many Americans supported him. And so, um, you know, this book is me going out and talking to people who have very different political points of view than I do, and just trying to understand to the best of my ability what was happening. And
And I do come away thinking that a certain amount of this is manufactured, that that some of this has been foisted on us, that that there are politicians um, and various actors out there that are making money from our polarization. And um, and I and that's where, you know, and we started talking about this um, at the beginning of the interview. That's where I really became convinced that we need to be working on a community level um, and being in relationship with each other, because on a national level, there's there's a, a real uh, interest in having Americans polarized.